is chapter 20, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Again, you shall say to the children of Israel, Whoever of the children of Israel, or of the strangers who dwell in Israel, who gives any of his descendants to Molech, he shall surely be put to death. People of the land shall stone him with stones. You say, who is Molech? Well, we touched on this in the past, but Molech was a a, a disgusting pagan god, and his worshippers would offer their children to this god, uh, burn the children alive as an as an offering to this demonic God. And God says, nobody in this land where I'm taking you is to practice that hideous religion. Anybody who thinks that stoning parents to death for burning their children alive as an offering to Molech is too severe they're probably part of the crime problem in America today child killers don't need a second chance child killers don't need sympathy they don't need a second chance we need to guarantee that they don't get a second chance to hurt another child and God says you put them to death look at verse 3 I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Moloch to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. Offering children to Moloch is exactly what Israel eventually did, if you can believe it. In Jeremiah chapter 37, verse, or excuse me, chapter 7, Verse 31, listen to what the word says. The prophet Jeremiah speaking about Israel, speaking the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 7:31. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will no more be called Tophet, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Tophet until there is no room. The corpses of this people will be food for the birds of the heaven and for the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. That's because they did that. They burnt their children to this detestable pagan God. And God turned his face against them, just like he said he would. Look at verse 4, back in Leviticus chapter 20. And if the people of the land should in any way hide their eyes from the man, when he gives some of his descendants to Molech, and they do not kill him, then I will set my face against that man and against his family. God says, I, I will then. If they don't do it, then I will. And I will cut him off from his people. And all who prostitute themselves with him to commit harlotry with Molech. To witness this murder of a child for Molech and yet remain silent made that person a partner in the crime. And God said, I will personally take care of it because he's not going to get away with this abominable murder of an innocent child. But anybody who witnessed that and didn't do anything to stop it or didn't do anything to to bring this man to justice after it was done, let me tell you something. He was a partner in the crime. Just like today. Liberals who refuse to dish out just penalties, and I'll say something else, the people who re-elect them, 
they're just as guilty they are guilty right along with the criminal who gets released who isn't brought to justice you know we have a responsibility to be good citizens this is something that God has given us a responsibility to be good citizens and that includes fighting for justice and if we don't we turn our eyes away from justice we pretend that we don't see maybe it will go away it won't go away there is no there is absolutely no excuse for indifference look at verse 6 and the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself with them I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people down in verse 27 it says a man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death they shall stone them with stones their blood shall be upon them both those who partake in this sort of stuff the customers if you will and the ones who are promoting it they're both equally guilty God says you play around with the occult you practice sorcery and you die that's your just punishment somebody says why look at verse 7 consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy for I am the Lord your God and you shall keep my statutes and perform them I am the Lord who sanctifies you why somebody says why why do they die from practicing the occult sorcery witchcraft Ouija boards fortune telling all these things why why die because involvement with the occult is spiritual adultery and for Israel it was treason because God was not only their God he was their king remember this is God's world and God deserves our obedience and he demands our holiness and he demands our loyalty and he demands that we look to him and to him only for direction not to tarot cards or these other things verse 9 for everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death he has cursed his father or his mother his blood shall be upon him somebody says well God says everyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely put, be put to death somebody says why he answers the question right off the bat in the last part of verse 9 he has cursed his father or mother good enough reason this idea of a child being able to sue his parents for divorce that you hear about today what a damnable idea now if a child is in danger because a parent is irresponsible or abusive that's one thing then get the poor child out of that situation but children are given too much leeway to disrespect their parents today and to not not honor the authority in the home See, God established family government did you know that and he puts parents in charge of that family government rebellion against parents is therefore rebellion against God and any parent that allows their child to disrespect them brings a curse on that child and a curse on their family and if enough families do it ultimately a curse on the entire nation verse 10 the man who commits adultery with another man's wife he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death the man who lies with his father's wife has uncovered his father's nakedness both of them shall surely be put to death their blood shall be upon them if a man lies with his daughter-in-law both of them shall surely be put to death they have committed perversion their blood shall be upon them 
If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them shall both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man marries a woman and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burned with fire, both he and they, that are that, that there may be no wickedness among you. If a man mates with an animal, he shall surely be put to death, and you shall kill the animal. If a woman approaches any animal and mates with it, you shall kill the woman and the animal. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. A list of really disgusting sexual sins. And this entire section that we just read, verses 10 through 16, they deal with uns- really unspeakable sexual sins. And I want you to notice something. Notice that God puts adultery, incest, homosexuality, and bestiality all in the same category. I'm telling you, you're a homosexual, a practicing homosexual. You are no different in the eyes of God than an adulterer. You are no different in the eyes of God than somebody who is committing incest or bestiality, having sex with an animal. All of these things are in the same category. You who are committing adultery, you are in the same category as somebody who is having sex with an animal in God's eyes. They're all wicked. They're all abominations which deserve death. Why does God hate these things so much? Because these are the sins that destroy families and as a result, destroy nations. Sex sins destroyed Babylon. They destroyed Egypt. They destroyed Rome. And look at our nation. They are destroying America as well. Verse 17. If a man takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and sees her nakedness, and she sees his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his guilt. To mess around with your sister... Both of you will be disgraced by being openly forced out of the community. That's what that means. So apparently incest with a full sister or a half-sister was not punished by death, but by expulsion from the camp. It was wrong. Verse 18. If a man lies with a woman during her sickness and uncovers her nakedness, He has exposed her flow, and she has uncovered the flow of her blood. Both of them shall be cut off from their people. Having intercourse during menstruation is a sin, but it was not to be punished by death, only separation from the camp. Verse 19, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, nor of your father's sister, for that would uncover his near of kin. They shall bear their guilt. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. If a man takes his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He has uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. In verse 20 it said that they shall die childless childless the penalty for these forms of incest with near kin was not death as it was in the case of a parent and a child Uh, God simply says you're going to die childless now that doesn't mean that they would never be able to have children Uh, what it may mean is that their children would die before them they would live to see the death of their children which is a terrible thing for any parent or it may mean that their children would not have any 
hereditary privileges. Look at verse 22. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them, that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out. Pretty graphic language. But you see, that's what happened to the Canaanites. The land literally vomited them out, according to what God said. You just had to get them out of that land because they were destroying the land like a like uh, some sort of a, a virus or some sort of a, a sickness is working on your stomach, you know, and you gotta your stomach just vomits it out to get rid of it. You see, this idea that we can live any way we please and not pay a price as a nation is dead wrong. That we sing God bless America but we cut his blessings off by our abominable sins he wants to pour out his blessings on us because he's a God that wants to bless but by sinning and calling good bad and bad good and calling evil good and perversion normal what we are doing is turning the faucet off so God can't pour out his blessing on us. But we can't live any way we please. One of these days, if we keep going in the direction that we are going, God is a consistent God and and, and this land is going to vomit us out. Verse 23. And you shall not walk in the statutes of the nation which I am casting out before you. For they commit all these things, and therefore I abhor them. You know, some people have the mistaken idea that God's law and His moral principles and His commandments are only relevant for the nation Israel. I don't know where they get that idea. They were given to Israel, but they apply to all nations. And the people in the land of Canaan were not God's chosen people but the land vomited them out because they broke God's law and God says here in verse 23 that he abhors them because of the way they were acting God's law is not confined to any one nation it has jurisdiction over the entire world and we are doing these things in America and calling them normal nobody has enough guts to stand up and say listen this thing that you're doing is wrong but they are wrong and we're doing them and since God is no respecter of persons and he's not he doesn't play favorites I can only conclude that God abhors us today as well Look at verse 24. But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, who has separated you from the peoples. God says that land is flowing with milk and honey. That means it was a land that was blessed agriculturally. I mean, it could really produce crops. This is the kind of great land that God was giving the nation Israel look at verse 25 you shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean between unclean birds and clean and you shall not make yourselves abominable by beast or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground which I have separated from you as unclean remember God's special diet well His diet for his people not only made them healthier and we kind of touched on that when we looked at it in detail uh, but it made intermarriage between the heathen and the Israelites less likely actually it made fellowship any kind of fellowship between the heathen and the Israelites less likely because they acted differently and they ate differently and that was a way of keeping them separate from the pagans who did not worship God verse 26 
and you shall be holy to me. For I, the Lord, am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. What a privilege. God reached down and picked little Israel out to be his special people and separated them and wanted to use them to bring the pagans into a relationship with him. You know, he wasn't being exclusive. Everybody was invited to become an Israelite and worship the one true God. But the Bible says, salvation is of the Jews, Jesus said, which means that in the Old Testament you had to become a Jew. You had to be circumcised and enter into their camp in order to have a relationship with God. Now that's not the case today. Everybody can come to Jesus Christ one-on-one and have a relationship with God through Him. Have their sins forgiven simply by repenting and asking Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. But again, God gives Israel the command to be holy. Why? For He is holy. Holiness isn't cool today. Even in some churches, it's not cool. But God demands it. He absolutely demands it, whether it's cool or not, whether it's accepted or not. Now, He doesn't demand it in order to be saved, but because we are saved and because it's right. He demands holiness from His children out of appreciation for what He has done. That's what He's looking for. Let's go into chapter 21. And as we do, let me say that in the next two chapters, we have the law for the personal purity of the priests. You know, originally, God intended that the entire nation of Israel would be a kingdom of priests, would be the go-between between the rest of the world and God. All of them were to be priests. But uh, with the golden calf sin, you remember that, those plans were changed. Levi, the, uh, the, the tribe of Levi, showed themselves to be faithful at that time. So the priesthood fell to that one tribe, the tribe of Levi. And let's look at Leviticus chapter 21, verse 1. Regulations for conduct of priests. And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests the sons of Aaron, and say to them, None shall defile himself for the dead among his people. None of the priests shall defile himself for the dead among his people, except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother, also his virgin sister who is near to him, who has had no husband. For her he may defile himself contact with the dead brought ceremonial defilement the priest had to be careful in this area now the priest could defile himself by touching the bodies of these close relatives that God lists in these first three verses but he was not permitted to defile himself for anybody else He had to keep himself ceremonially clean. Because you know why? It's because the priest is the picture of Christ. He is a type of Christ who, when he came into this world, came into this world to be holy, undefiled by sin, unspotted by any sin. Look at verse 4. Otherwise... He shall not defile himself, being a chief man man among his people, to profane himself. The priest's high office required a stricter separation than the average Israelite. Now we can draw principle from that for today. Every single Christian should separate themselves from worldliness. The high priest and or the priest. He had to be he had to be subject to a stricter standard than the rest of, of Israel. And you know, believers, we are all priests of the Lord. We are a kingdom of priests. That's what the Bible says. All of us who know Jesus Christ. So we have a higher standard as well. 
we ought to separate ourselves from worldliness from anything that would defile our souls but you know and that goes for every believer but you know a believer in a position of of authority or a believer in position of responsibility needs to be even more careful because of our position verse 5 they shall not make any bald place on their heads nor shall they shave the edges of their beards nor make any cuttings in their flesh well that seems like sort of a strange command to us today but you know when you understand the context and you understand the historical context of this command it begins to make more sense because God says don't make any bald spots on your head don't shave the edges of your beards nor make cuttings in your flesh well you see the heathen in those days did these things they were pagan acts of mourning for the dead here's a principle a person who claims to be a Christian a person who professes to be one of God's people should not mimic the practices of the world God says I don't want you messing around looking like these guys did and I don't want you messing around with any of their morning rituals because you're different don't get involved in that kind of stuff that holds true for us today I'm telling you Believers should not mimic the practices of this world. We don't want to be like them. God doesn't want us to act like them. He doesn't want us to to mimic them in any way in order to be accepted by them, in order to be thought of as, as cool by them. No, that's not what we're called to do. We're called to follow God. Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Look at verse 6. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire and the bread of their God. Therefore they shall be holy. The priest's position demanded some things from them. The priest's position demanded holiness, dignity, and self-control they could not do anything that they felt like doing that's because they were God's representatives and you see the same is true for all believers today we're God's representatives it's the idea of acting with dignity it's the idea of acting with self-control allowing the spirit of God to fill us and control us and the fruit of the Spirit will be self-control. We won't go around doing anything that we feel like doing, regardless of what it is. Ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And all these things, holiness and dignity and self-control and meekness and faithfulness, these things will be byproduct of that prayer, of that decision to be filled with the Spirit of God. This is true for all believers, but again, it's especially true for church leaders like the priests verse 7 they shall not take a wife who is a harlot or a defiled woman nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband for the priest is holy to his God therefore you shall consecrate him for he offers the bread of your God he shall be holy to you for I the Lord who sanctify you am holy a priest had to watch who they married they couldn't even marry a reformed prostitute even if she had given up her trade she couldn't he could not marry a reformed prostitute um, could not marry somebody who wasn't a believer in the true God couldn't marry a divorced woman I suppose he couldn't marry a divorced woman maybe there you know there might be some suspicions in the mind of some that they had a relationship going while she was still married could not do any of those things had to be very careful and you know today it's important that church leaders be an example to others our position demands a higher standard look at verse 9 
the daughter of any priest? If she profanes herself by playing the harlot, she profanes her father. She shall be burned with fire. Boy, you think it's tough being a preacher's child today. Look at this. Like it or not, children are a reflection of their parents. They really are for the most part. And uh, this is why the Bible says in the New Testament that a church elder's children must be well behaved because they reflect their parents. And, you know, back in these days, in the book of Leviticus, if a daughter disgraced her father, if a daughter disgraced the office of the priesthood, she needed to be severely punished. I'm talking about being burned here. And, you know, you don't want to burn up some elder's child today, but let's get the principle down. Let's wake up to the fact that an elder's child has to be disciplined. They can't be allowed to get away with rebellion because it reflects badly on the elder who is a leader in the church, so it reflects badly on that church and on Christ himself. Like it or not, if you're in a position of authority in the church, you are looked up to as something special by many people. And you are held to a higher standard. And so are your children. And they have to be well behaved, the Bible says. If a man cannot govern his own family, how can he govern the church of the living God? That's what the New Testament says. Verse 10. He who is... By the way, let me just say this. There are some people right now, some pastors and some elders, serving in our churches who, who are disqualified because their families are not under control. They're not controlling their families. They have no right to be in that office. They may be good preachers. They may be faithful to attend church services. But you know what? They don't belong there. They are disqualified. And they're ruining churches. And they're ruining the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it must be dealt with. Verse 10. He who is the high priest among his brethren, on whose head the anointing oil was poured, and who is consecrated to wear the garments, shall not uncover his head, nor tear his clothes, nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself for his father or his mother, nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God, for the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. I am the Lord. The high priest was not to tear his garments. Well, if you look in Matthew chapter 26, verse 25, I'm not going to turn there, but uh, when Jesus was arrested, the, the high priest, matter of fact, let me turn there. Let me read it. Matthew 26, verse, what did I say? 65. Okay, they arrest Jesus, okay? And Jesus is brought before the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin. And the high priest presides over the Sanhedrin. And of course, this was just a big mockery of justice. They had already condemned Jesus to death in their mind. And now they're just looking for a charge to bring against them that would help them to feel justified in their wicked scheme. But uh, Jesus says in verse 64... In, in response to their question their question was are you the son of God and Jesus said in response to that it is as you said nevertheless I say to you hereafter you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven now look at the high priest's response then the high priest tore his clothes saying he has spoken blasphemy the high priest just lost it and he went into a tirade you know, and started screaming, He has blasphemy, And he tore his clothes. Well, this high priest has just broken God's law. God specifically said, Don't you tear your clothes if you're the high priest. And that was a sign of grief. But he wasn't supposed to do that. He wasn't supposed to tear his garments. He wasn't allowed to attend a funeral. Even that of his parents. See, the high priest 
he had to be totally dedicated to God. Absolutely 100% dedicated to God and separated from any form of defilement at all. Couldn't even go to the funeral of his parents. You know, he had to stay on duty 24 hours a day. He's a picture of Jesus. Jesus is called the great high priest. And these high priests could not defile themselves one bit. Could not do anything that would ceremonially defile themselves because they were a picture of our great high peace priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was without spot, without blemish, without sin, without any moral defilement at all. And he came to do the Father's will. And he didn't do anything but the Father's will. And that's why the things were so strict. The standards were so strict for the high priest. They were a reflection, a type of Christ. Look at verse 13. Still talking about the high priest. He shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow or a divorced woman or a defiled woman or a harlot. These he shall not marry. But he shall take a virgin of his own people as wife. Nor shall he profane his posterity among his people. For I, the Lord, sanctify him. Don't profane your posterity by breaking one of these rules, high priest. See, he could not marry a widow, and he could not marry a divorced woman, nor could he marry a harlot. Any violation of these marriage rules would cause his children to be profaned. In other words, his family would live in disgrace because of his disobedience. And God didn't want that for his children. Look at verse 16. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. For any man who has a defect shall not approach. A man blind or lame who has a marred face or any limb too long, a man who has a broken foot or a broken hand or is a hunchback or a dwarf or a man who has a defect in his eye or eczema or scab or is a eunuch. No man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. These physical deformities disqualified a Levite from serving as a priest. The offering was to be without blemish. We've seen that in the past. Whatever was offered, whatever animal was offered, had to be without blemish. And so was the priest. And this is important. It's got important symbolic value once again. Because both the offering and the priest who offered it were a picture of Jesus Christ who was perfect in both his person and in his work. Jesus was the perfect high priest. He was the perfect man and he offered up the perfect sacrifice. That's why these Old Testament sacrifices had to be without blemish and the priest had to be without physical defect. Verse 22. He may eat the bread of his God, both the most holy and the holy, only he shall not go near the veil or approach the altar because he has a defect, lest he profane my sanctuaries, for I the Lord sanctify them. And Moses told it to Aaron and his sons, and to all the children of Israel. So, you know, God is is kind. He's a good God. And blemished men, you know, they could not be priests because God has a standard to uphold and a type to withhold to uphold. But God said, no, they can't be priests. But don't shut them out from the Lord's table. I mean, don't make them, you know, exclude them from eating the the sacred bread. And, you know, they could perform other duties, but they just could not be priests. Not everybody is qualified to do every job. Some believers today are not gifted for certain positions in the church. 
or maybe they're not physically qualified for certain positions in the church but that doesn't mean they can't serve Jesus God has a place of service for all believers well let's go into chapter 22 here verses 1 and 2 then the Lord spoke to Moses saying speak to Aaron and his sons that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel and that they do not profane my holy name by what they dedicate to me I am the Lord God is saying don't profane the holy things of God God is saying show respect for the holy things of God don't treat them like common things Aaron was not allowed to bring the sacred things of the tabernacle home with him there had to be a separation between holy things and common things verse 3 say to them whoever of all your descendants throughout your generations who goes near the holy things which the children of Israel dedicate to the Lord while he has uncleanness upon him that person shall be cut off from my presence I am the Lord the priest couldn't be careless as he carried out his duties if he served while ceremonially unclean he'd lose his priestly position lesson for us today believers can't afford to be careless either we need to be ever vigilant not careless but vigilant on guard on guard against sin on guard against the devil on guard against worldly ungodly influences in our lives if we become careless we too may lose out on many opportunities to be fruitful in the service of God just like the priest would lose out on future opportunities to serve can't be careless gotta be on guard verse 4 whatever man of the descendants of Aaron who is a leper or who has a discharge shall not eat the holy offerings until he is clean and whoever touches anything made unclean by a corpse or a man who has an emission of semen or whoever touches any creeping thing by which he would be made unclean or any person by whom he would become unclean whatever his uncleanness may be the person who has touched any such thing shall be unclean until evening and shall not eat the holy offerings unless he washes his body with water and when the sun goes down he shall be clean and afterward he may eat the holy offerings because it is his food whatever dies naturally or is torn by beast he shall not eat to defile himself with it I am the Lord they shall therefore keep my ordinance lest they bear sin for it and die thereby if they profane it I am the Lord and I sanctify them and God is serious about this business of becoming unclean they might even die for it doesn't even say might does it the priest didn't have any special privileges when it came to God's demand for separation from the unclean his private life was to be as set apart to God as his religious duties were if anything he was to be more careful than the average guy because he was to be an example for the rest of Israel verse 10 no outsider shall eat the holy offering one who dwells with the priest or a hired servant shall not eat the holy thing see the priest was to make sure that no stranger that is no uncircumcised person was to enter the tabernacle or partake of the holy things the privilege of divine fellowship is reserved for the sons of God in Christ Jesus today as well the unclean the strangers those outside the covenant of Israel and God were not allowed to partake of the holy things and you and I if we don't know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior if somebody today does not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior they are not a part of God's people they are not part of God's family and they don't have the privilege of having fellowship with God verse 11 but if the priest buys a person with his money he may eat it and one who is born in his house may eat his food if the priest's daughter is married to an outsider she may not eat of the holy offerings 
But if the priest's daughter is a widow or divorced and has no child and has returned to her father's house as in her youth, she may eat her father's food, but no outsider shall eat it. Here it is again. Only those who are in the priest's family or those who belong to him could eat his food, which was holy. If his daughter married a Gentile, she could no longer eat either. Strict separation here from the holy things of God. Verse 14, And if a man eats the holy offering unintentionally, then he shall restore a holy offering to the priest and add one-fifth to it. They shall not profane the holy offerings of the children of Israel, which they offered to the Lord, or allow them to bear the guilt of trespass when they eat their holy offerings. For I, the Lord, sanctify them. The priest had to guard that sanctuary, let me tell you. And the, they had to guard the sanctuary and they had to guard the holy things from outsiders. Even if an outsider ate the holy things unintentionally, he had to pay a fine. God is very strict about this. Well, I think we'll pick up our study next time in verse.